there's been a lot of news, uh, a lot of talk about the fact that on a most recent Apple devices, you don't have a power power brick inside the package. Mm. And uh, I know in our case, we have been using a certain power brick from Anchor, the nano power brick to charge up the various iOS devices, the latest iOS devices. Uh, they became a sponsor, so we have plenty of these things lying around and it sort of solved the problem. However, a lot of people don't really understand what's going on in the charge space or don't care that much or just, well, yeah, haven't been paying attention. But we've been, there have been some charge technologies that have delivered this increased power output while at the same time shrinking the scale of the charger itself. Now, yesterday uh, on the last show, we talked about Huawei experimenting with a 135 watt smartphone charger. We've talked about 65 watt chargers that fit in your pocket, 100 watt chargers. They're using, di well, different technologies. It's not always identical. However, at the root of some of the best current portable charge tech is this technology called GAN and GAN based chargers. And this is a uh, gallium nitride. It's a completely new technology. Well, not that new right now, but apparently new to some of the major manufacturers that haven't shipped it yet alongside smartphones. It's been, uh, the GAN marketplace has been dominated by third party sellers, which is kind of weird. Mm. You would think that these big names that these uh, multi-billion slash practically trillion dollar companies would be interested in presenting this tech to their customers who are already spending thousands of dollars. It, it would be it'd be interesting or exciting, possibly. Uh, it could be um, uh, a novel experience for a buyer to crack open the box and see this tiny little charger capable of 20, 20 watts of power delivery which is the, that's the nano product we've been promoting. However, you can get in some circumstances an entire laptop charger, which is the size of say Apple's current 30 watt charger. That's the level of this tech and what it's capable of. So obviously very exciting. Now, up until this point, we haven't heard a lot about it. It seems like Apple is kind of okay with being hands off in this area, as well as the other manufacturers who now plan to not ship chargers inside of their inside of their boxes but maybe that's not good enough maybe even if you're not going to include the charger but you're going to continue to sell a first party charger as an add-on then there's still pressure to adapt and there's still uh, at least from a positive perspective th there's a push whether internally or externally to do something better than what you're currently doing. Mm. And we had another story yesterday about how uh, within Apple's charger selection, it's bizarre the way they all operate and the fact that a lot of them don't even have the PD feature, which came recently on their, on their latest chargers. But you're still far better off going the third party route. As you're aware, you're either gonna save money or get more currently as far as chargers are concerned. But anyway, that's going to change. Apple does care. The pressure is there, whether it's internal or external, to invest in gallium nitride technologies and better chargers, smaller chargers delivering more power. There's a nice little graphic here in a Mac Rumors article showcasing how you can get a 60-watt power adapter for a laptop in a much smaller footprint. And you have to remember, Will, this has implications not just for the smartphones, but it also has implications for the laptops. They go to the M1 chip. They got to include a power brick in the box. That thing can shrink down with this technology as well. Totally capable of powering laptops. One charger to rule them all. That whole conversation. Mm -hmm. Apple, it could be interesting, maybe from an environmental standpoint, to only sell one charger as well. Right. Or maybe two instead of this current variety of chargers that's out there on the laptop side. And, of course, we would also need the phones to be USB Type-C to simplify things even further. But that hasn't happened yet. So this company, Navitas Semiconductor, is expecting to obtain orders from Apple in 2021 for fast charging solutions based on GAN technology, according to the Taiwanese industry publication Digitimes. A lot of this information always ends up coming from, seems to always end up coming from Digitimes. Uh, 
The report claims that Apple's chip-making partner, TSMC, will supply Navitas with the GAN chips as part of an existing partnership. So we have these brands like uh, Anchor and Belkin and others that sell GAN chargers, but they purchase the technology from other providers, and then that ends up going into their chargers. I was amazed at how complex this GAN stuff was. I started to look into it a little bit. In fact, I think the GAN people reached out. It may have been uh, Navitas, and they sent us a box full of GAN chargers from all these different brands. They don't care which brands you buy it from because on some level, you're going back to them mm -hmm. to get the uh, ingredients necessary to have that charger. So some of the brands included in there, Anchor, Belkin, Aki, Dell, Lenovo, Xiaomi has been sending, uh, selling these chargers. We've had other ones on the channel. It's hard to even remember all of them. Many of my favorites, crazy portable, tremendous power delivery. Currently, Apple sells USB-A options, 5 watt, 12 watt, a 20, 30, 61, and 96 watt, all USB type C options, none of which are utilizing this GAN tech. It's, uh, it's gonna be cool to see. It sounds like it's happening in 2021. And uh, I don't know what it's gonna do to the, to the third party section of the market. I think that's still gonna be there. I think they're probably still gonna be lower on the price point. Mm -hmm which is, uh, well, that's how the third party always operates. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, uh, more technology is better, and it's especially better when the big brands em embrace it. Today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. I don't know if you knew this, Will, but those ISPs, those internet service providers, they see all your internet activity. They see everything that you're doing. Everything? Yeah, that's right. And then they send an email to me directly. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe not to me, but if I was the highest bidder, they might because they actually generate revenue based on user data in certain circumstances. And there's something you can do about it, believe it or not. If you want to protect your online activities, if you want some added security and privacy online, you can do that very simply with the click of a button by using ExpressVPN. It's a simple app for your computer or smartphone. It will encrypt all your da network data, tunnel it through a secure VPN server so that your ISP cannot see any of your activity. There is no more restriction on what you can watch either as you bounce around the variety of online streaming services that may have regional availability. You can use a VPN for that purpose as well. I do this frequently when I'm looking for a particular piece of content that for whatever reason might be restricted in the location that I happen to be in. So ExpressVPN is gonna do that for you. It's available everywhere, all your devices. It's super simple to operate and it does not slow down your connection. Some people are, uh, can be afraid of that. And some people may have experienced that in the past if they're trying to use some subpar VPN, they think, oh, I'm gonna take a hit on the performance side. Well, with ExpressVPN, you're not because they have so many servers to choose from and they're all high speed and tested and maintained and all of that. ExpressVPN is the number one rated VPN service by both CNET and Wired, you can try it out right now by heading to expressvpn.com slash lulater. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash lulater. You will get three extra months free. So use the correct URL, expressvpn.com slash lulater to get those three extra months free and begin to protect your activities online and open up all that extra content when you start to check out the regional versions of your favorite streaming services. I'll drop a link down in the description. It's expressvpn.com slash lulater. Thanks to them for sponsoring this episode. So speaking about chargers and the fact that they're no longer included inside the box of your iPhone purchase and presumably your upcoming smartphone purchase since Samsung appears set to do something similar to what Apple did. We had a weird debate that emerged yesterday on Twitter around the idea of these boxes and whether or not they should be held onto hmm. with or without a charger having originally shipped in them. Just boxes in general. iPhone boxes, 
But I think we can open the discussion to smartphone boxes, gadget boxes, laptop boxes, whatever box a person feels compelled to hold on to, and whether or not it's justified for an individual to hold on to this box or if they should just ditch it. So it started with an, a question from Twitter user Bissarat. I don't know who needs to hear this, but throw away that box your iPhone came in. You don't need it. You will never need it. And that had 680,000 likes and uh, 63,000 people tweeting about it. Tremendous. Incredible. It struck a nerve with people feeling passionate on both sides of this particular argument. And by, by the way, this is one of those real uh, viral tweets? Yeah. It came from an individual without a tremendous number of followers, 2,891 followers. Probably many of them came because of this tweet as well. So anyway, this tweet takes off and people start talking about it. They say the pros and cons. So the pros for holding onto the box are pretty straightforward. You have certain identification characteristics like your IMEI number that are on the box in case for whatever reason you can't get into your phone and you need to access that. It's a backup. And then also for resale. So if you go to sell your device at a later date on, let's say, uh, eBay or Craigslist or whatever around here, people use Kijiji, something like this. People appreciate, buyers appreciate having had the original box. Mm -hmm. And they may pay you a little extra if the original box is included. So that's the argument for keeping the box the argument for not keeping the box is pretty obvious it's taking up space you have limited space and where do you draw the line hanging on to all this cardboard mm -hmm. but i think the reason that this particular topic has struck a chord is because people don't just hold on to their boxes quietly for that one day when they sell they kind of display them in some circumstance you see it on the bookshelf yeah so they had the boxes up there like a point of pride as if they've achieved something, like mm. trophies on yep. the shelf. Now, I'm not telling people how to behave, but I can see why that might rub some people the wrong way, particularly if they don't have those devices or uh, appreciate other devices that are different from your particular selections. So, things like this. You might have the... Uh, it might not even be resentment. It might just be that a person disagrees that you should showcase your consumption habits in the form of the boxes displayed on your shelves. These are all the potential takes, but it, it, it stirred things up online and it had people thinking about what else they could do with boxes, with iPhone boxes that might actually lead to something useful outside of just leaving it on the shelf for display. So you have Certain Twitter users that turned, well, in this case, you can see the box has been turned into a kind of makeshift stand for Halloween. I believe if you continue to scroll down, you'll see other options, a place to hold uh, pins, push oh. pins inside of one of the compartments of the Apple box. A joystick was built oh. into the box of an iPhone 6S. That's fun. So many different ways in which there's an Etch-A-Sketch that fit into, I guess that's an iPad box. Anyway, the, the question remains, Will. Yeah. I gave you all the different points of view on this. Do you hold on to your iPhone, smartphone, laptop, tablet box? I do, yeah. You do. And it's mainly for uh, resale. But you don't resale, do you? <laughs> I used to. I know, but now Back you don't. In the day. Now you don't. No, I don't. I leave the boxes here. <laughs> So, first of all, studio. for you and I, it's a very bizarre it's a different scenario conversation because we're storing, we just have a lot of devices around. Uh, but I'm asking you to imagine you're just will do outside of this particular job, and then you yeah. think you probably would be reselling. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't stick the box on like a mantle or like mm. a glass case mm. to present it. Yeah. But it would be in storage somewhere. Yeah. I would say uh, I transitioned actually in my life. What I would you? say I used to be box camp. Okay. I'm hanging on to boxes. I mean, I yeah. named the channel on box therapy. I ha I used to hang on to boxes. Now I am so far the other way in my in you're, you're my done life. With them. Who I have them? so it's so much crap. It's so much stuff from this channel. You start to look at it differently. Hmm. It's less of a worship thing anymore. 
mm. where it's like, oh, wow, the careful little, the precious thing. And it's just inevitable with the amount of exposure to gadgets and products and things like this. It's going to happen. And so, and, and also at my house, I have, there's a lot of people, there's a dog now, there's just stuff, man. Yeah. And in a way, I've, as I've aged, I've begun to appreciate the absence of stuff more than the presence of stuff. Mm. And I'm talking all stuff mm. that if we, I feel uh, a, a, a greater sense of calm and a greater sense of some, some type of order when the stuff is not overflowing. Are and, you a minimalist? No, I'm not a minimalist. Okay. I'm definitely not to that, no. to that level yet. I think if you go too far, it can, things can feel, uh, it can't. It might not be a comfortable place to be. Yeah. Where, where, but there is a line for each individual. I'll just say I went. I definitely have been traveling this spectrum uh. towards an appreciation towards a lack of stuff. And I just, per, I just recently purchased some accessories and things for stuff at home. I fixed the Apple remote problem, oh, okay. which I don't know if we want to go into this whole thing. But actually, a user on Twitter recommended that I just put a case on it, a fat case. Oh. I found a fat case, which was also neon in color. And I'm not going to remember the name of the company that made it right now. But I bought, I purchased one of these so that, yes, yeah, something like this, so that the remote would be more ergonomic to hold and be less likely to go missing. Just a little substance to it. Mm -hmm. Super happy with it. But anyways... I purchased a couple of other accessories, including another. That's a nice one right yeah. there. The wooden TV remote case. Maybe I should pick that up, but it is 50 bucks. <laughs> which yeah. uh, And a dog's going to chew on it likely as soon as it's the nice. But it, that's nice what they did there. It is, yeah. Maybe I will pick that up. Anyway, so I ordered some other Apple accessories, Apple-specific stuff, including a keyboard case for an iPad, like their expensive keyboard. I chucked that box so fast. I barely had the thing out. And I was frisbeeing that baby all the way to the recycling. Yeah. I couldn't get out of my face fast enough all this extra packaging. Mm. So anyway, it's like, it is a transition thing. And, and, but I get it. I think probably if I was single and I had a limited possessions and this was really a big deal to have this phone or whatever, and I could keep it relatively condensed to the number of boxes I was holding onto, because that's really what I would have used to, used to do. Yeah. It and is nostalgic in a sense too, you know. The box is very pristine. You kind of look at it, and it feels new. You're de yeah, you remember getting your device. Yeah, you man. It's all it. heavy yeah. stuff in there as far as enthusiasm mm -hmm. around tech products. I'm not hating on anyone. I think you can justify in either direction. I'm just talking about the transition I made in my life around boxes. Willie, do yeah. I really feel like it's this exposure? I feel like you did the same to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you would have been far on one spectrum and then it's a, this exposure we've had through this life that we've led the last, for me, I don't know, more than a decade for you, six years, something like that. Yeah, yeah. It changes you. It does. It really for sure. absolutely changes you. Apple is going to temporarily close all of its remaining Apple stores in the UK. The UK is having COVID troubles, man. Uh, London... High numbers, mutations, all the rest of it. Mutations, wow. <laughs> they're, Sounds they're, so I don't know. I'm, not, I'm laughing out of a sense of nervousness, not necessarily humor. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Apple, I guess, was trying to maintain a sense of normalcy by keeping certain stores open in that market. However, now it's shutting them down completely. All 18 UK Apple stores will close from January 5th. Every location in Scotland... And most of the other stores had actually closed before the holidays. So you're talking complete lockdown status all across the UK from uh, Ireland to, to uh, England to Scotland. Although it looks like there's, there's only one store in Ireland by the looks of it on this particular map. So not, not necessarily surprising, but an indication via tech via Apple, an indication of the state of affairs going on over there. And I guess it's an online only experience for now, not just in the UK, probably elsewhere too. Can they pick up product? 
yeah, in that's the what, stores. So that's the thing. Is if it you, completely shut down? If you have them or locked down. If you have a shutdown of the retail store, to me that sounds like you also don't want employees traveling there. To mm. me, that's what that sounds like. Mm. That does not sound like a curbside pickup scenario to me. Right. But maybe it's one of those halfway things. It all depends on the severity. Because if in the ultimate form of severity, you would just say, hey, order online. We don't even want our employees traveling in here. We want them staying home too. So, uh, But actually, I don't, it doesn't state in this particular article if it's... Uh, if it's going to be any kind of express service. Oh, actually, some of the stores will continue offering an express service. And in those cases, you could pick up on line orders, but no browsing. So uh, it sounds like some of them huh. will go express. Some of them will close completely. Anyway, obviously not ideal news. Mm. But as far as stores are concerned, Apple, not really that essential. <laughs> No. Right, most people are ordering this stuff online anyway. Yeah. We have a new leak here hinting at what might happen with the S21 Ultra S Pen. So we had this rumor going on, going back for a bit now, about the S series, the S lineup inheriting Note features, and most of it was around this S Pen. But then I started questioning, and others, where do you put it? Like, that's the whole thing with the Note. You have this nice little area to keep your S Pen in. Well, some imagined that there would be some sort of a case, some sort of a sleeve or some sort of a slot. And this is our first glimpse into what that might look like. If you scroll down, there's a tweet from Twitter user Roland Quant. Samsung S21 Ultra is getting an optional S Pen. Here's your first official look at the stylus and how Samsung will let you carry it along in the official clear view and silicone covers. Yeah. Oh, it didn't load for you? <laughs> You're gonna, you'll, maybe hopefully you'll get it over here. Yeah, there you go. This case gives you a good idea. This picture. However, it doesn't show you the pen. So the, the pen is going to look a little different than the S Pen on the Note series. There you go. That's a better look. So it doesn't have the clicky bit on the end. It will still be touch activated on the end. But that clicky thing is very satisfying. Mm -hmm. Probably annoyingly to others that are around you. To but build a serious habit from that. Serious clicky. habit. But also the clicky portion was part of the channel in which it was stored. And you would pop it out using very that. Very satisfying. And the whole thing was satisfying. In this case, since it doesn't fit into a slot on the phone, maybe they wanted to make it more durable by eliminating that moving piece. That's that's my guess. But anyway, it fits into the sort of the side of the phone once you put it into this clear view case. And if you just scroll up back to the, you can see uh, right to the left hand side of the phone when you're facing it, there is this small little section which kind of makes the phone a bit fatter and it provides a little channel to slide your pen into. So that's how you're gonna carry it. Is that good enough to completely obsolete the Note series? I don't know. It's definitely not as convenient, mm -hmm. but from a flexibility standpoint, you can use this case in the pen when you're in a real pen mood and then not have to worry about carrying the pen around when you're less likely to use it. So it looks like that's going to be how they implement it. However, we don't have pictures of the silicone covers. Oh, I guess that's the silicone cover right there. Never mind. So the silicone cover is a bit weirder because now you have this asymmetric look at the phone because you got this fat bumper on the one side. I don't know if people are going to embrace that or not. Hmm. We'll have to wait and see. But that's going to make your device quite a bit fatter. And these are already huge, especially when you're talking about S21 Ultra stuff. So I see it being a more popular selection with the flip style wallet case types. Yeah. With the work types. The productive yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the office. With the suit and uh, always on the The people run. who actually work. <laughs> yeah, those people. The, the people who actually the work. And rarity nowadays. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, they got deadlines and reports. Yeah. Those are the people I'm talking about. Yep. They'll go for that. Oh, my God, this is funny. I like this story. I want to actually put this story first, but I was like, that's crazy. I hmm. can't put a story about 
boxes first. Funny enough, this is our second story about boxes, though. Uh, anyway, this is uh, something that IKEA has done to help you buy your media furniture, your media storage. They have created a mock-up of the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X in-store so that you can figure out if the furniture you're about to buy is going, going to fit your next generation console and how it's going to look when it's stored in there. I love this. Huh. This turns me on. I love this. I, I Let me... If you have ever attempted to, outside of doing your own 3D render, to mm -hmm. place an object into a... And of course, some are working on augmented reality to try to achieve yep. this effect. But to be there in real life and to not carry your PlayStation 5 with you or the PlayStation 5 you don't own yet or the Xbox Series X you're going to buy in the future and to know for a fact, oh, that's what it's going to look like inside of this storage furniture, inside this media furniture. I think that is, I love things that are tremendously useful. Mm -hmm. This is as useful as it gets. It has the measurements right on the thing. You know how many times in my life, Will, I got a measuring tape and I'm trying to envision something and I'm just wishing that I had a physical manifestation of the thing I'm either working on or the eventual uh, the problem I'm trying to solve. IKEA, they do it. They did it for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the shape of the PS5, like the fins are out as well. It's not just a box. It's very. It's it's pretty accurate. I love this. And nice attention to detail. Maybe I love this too much. Okay, well. I don't know. The way I'm talking about it, I'm starting to realize uh, yeah. I'm getting a little carried away here. But I love things that are just straight up useful. That's what this happens to be. And uh, I don't know. You know, what's curious about this is if IKEA is taking this into consideration, you have to wonder about a future in which there's also consideration around designing furniture that can accommodate these consoles. Mm -hmm. If they've already got these things in the store these cardboard mock-ups that look amazing, it indicates to me that they're concerned with the problem and they've heard enough from customers that this is a consideration. Yeah. So now my next phase of that is, well, now you got the team in the boardroom. Why not draw up the actual furniture PS5 compatible? Mm. You see what I'm saying? And yeah. then I can go on a website and pick PS5 compatible filter. TV benches. Yeah. And then it's all the ones that have been designed to accommodate a good spot for that thing to sit. Uh, That's some futuristic stuff right there. That's pretty efficient. I tell you what. <laughs> I'm not I'm not saying that's going to show up by the way. I'm just saying that I love this kind yes, of thing and I this agree. kind of thought process. Speaking of the PlayStation and Sony, they are discontinuing the PS4 Pro and all but one model of PS4 regular in Japan. And this is not much of a surprise. You have the PS5. The PS4 Pro was the same price as the digital only PS5. PS4 Pro, PS4, PS5 digital, same mm -hmm. price. But what's funny is that I've been telling a lot of people this who were looking for PlayStation 5s. I was like, you know, if you can find a PS4 Pro, it's kind of the same experience right now. For a for lot now. of for a lot of games. No, I'm no, I'm yeah. not suggesting somebody buys it, but yeah. maybe one of these pick it up off Craigslist or eBay uh -huh. or something and catch a deal in the meantime, hold the kids off. Yeah. Be yeah. like, we'll get a PS5 later. Anyway. So it, it makes a lot of sense that they're gonna discontinue those. This information is Japan specific. We don't know what's gonna happen in North America. They will hang on to one budget model PS4 in a, in a slim style, just plain black PS4 at a cheaper price point. But all the rest that they've ever done or continued to sell, including the PS4 Pro, will go away. And presumably this is not just because they wanna sell you a PS5, but also they need the maximum bandwidth in order to move all of that production over to meet this uh, incredible demand for the PlayStation 5. So I'm guessing that it's a little bit of both. You don't want to confuse the customer, have these two products at $399, and then at the same time, you need all hands on deck to, to produce as many PlayStation 5s as possible. Mm -hmm. I saw this article in Gizmodo about the LG 8K OLED display 
that I showed off on a recent uh, Unbox Therapy video. And I love this headline because it says, I will be forever ruined by this incredible 8K OLED that also costs $20,000. <laughs> and this is written by Katie Keck on Gizmodo. And I saw this headline and I thought to myself, you know what? I can't agree more with you. Yeah, this is the right way to... True. This... If you want to be ruined by a display, this is the display. Now she reviewed the 77 inch of this of this technology. We, in our new studio, we've got the 88 inch of this technology, which uh. takes things to another level and ruins you even further. This has to be one of my most favorite pieces of tech in a long, long time. You see Willie Do featured on the video, and we booted up some 8K clips that just wrecked me, wrecked my mind. I look at my TVs that aren't this TV. I hate them all. Yeah. I think to myself, I was watching Mandalorian, and I had a nice TV on, when I was watching the Mandalorian, but it wasn't this one. And I thought to myself, imagine it was that one. Yeah. That actually happened. Now, granted, the show, Disney Plus, Netflix, none of this stuff is 8K. So I have to imagine that next development as well to make the most of it. But this thing with the engine they put in it, that A9 stuff, even the 4K stuff looks tremendous. Even the gaming looks tremendous. So they uh, did some AI and up res. They do the up res. Yeah. They do the up res. And actually, I should state for the gamers, for those of you that haven't caught this video, I feel like you should go watch it most certainly. But if you didn't and you want a, a quick brief here, it's not just amazing 8K once we get that available or even the up res of the 4K from the streaming services etc but it's also a very capable gaming display featuring 4k 120 hertz which is what you're looking for with these next gen consoles so i play some of the spider-man i play some of the miles morales i tweak the settings and things get interesting so go check out the video that's a little teaser right there not to mention uh the stand that it's on tremendous is amazing as well really high quality unbelievable I just got paywalled, by the way, on our next story, oh. <laughs> which is about, which I'm going to, I'll find an alternative, but you're going to get paywalled too. Oh, yeah. And so this is a, a report <laughs> coming via JP Morgan about the eventual, the eventual Bitcoin peak. They don't even think we're close yet. I just put out a clip today about the new Bitcoin peak. But of course, uh, if you're, part of the current run-up, then you believe the peak is somewhere else, don't you? Oh, yeah. This peak is never going to run out, and I still think, yeah, so this article you have is kind of similar to the one I have. Bitcoin, JP Morgan believes Bitcoin can go to $146,000. $146,000. Imagine a report like that for people who are feeling Bitcoin FOMO. Uh-huh. And right now they're staring at 30 something thousand. They're like, 146, honey, let's get the savings going. <laughs> it's going to 146. Anyway, the reason that JP Morgan believes this is they believe that the cryptocurrency is going to or could occupy some of the space that gold occupies as far as people trying to uh, find a place to put their funds. Mm -hmm. as a place to store funds, uh, a place that is limited, something that is finite. And gold is kind of heavy. It's kind of old school. I know people love gold. Well, it's physical too. People love gold. You know, It's on the planet. I don't know where to find it. It's heavy to move it around. It's kind of, some of the drawbacks of gold are also the value of gold. Uh-huh. When and was melting it? melting it down, the whole process to create like a brick or something. The whole thing. And, and and also, I should mention, by the way, gold has some industrial uses as well. You have some gold in your smartphone and things like that. It has some, yeah. some uses as well, which is why with the recycling stuff, they're always trying to extract those precious metals uh -huh. out of your old devices. But anyway, JP Morgan thinks it can kind of take some, it can take some value away from gold as traditional gold investors actually move some of their cash into Bitcoin. Mm. And that's what would allow you to get to this tremendous long-term Bitcoin price target of more than $146,000. 
why are they so specific to it? It's like, because of that uh, that number. It's because of gold's value. It has it has a lot to do with. Let's see here. It's why they're mapping it against gold. Oh. While we cannot exclude the possibility that the current speculative mania will propagate further pushing the Bitcoin price up toward the consensus region of between 50000 and 100000 we believe that such price levels would pr prove unsustainable. Bitcoin's valuation and position backdrop has become more challenging in 2021. Uh... Gold is obviously not worth 146,000, but I guess if you th if you were trying to do the math on the scarcity of gold, say per ounce relative to how much of it that you feel you could continue to mine, production let's say, mm -hmm. I presume that JP Morgan's analysis to get to 146,000 is around the premise of the difficulty to mine it relative to the value of one single bitcoin. In other words, the gold equivalent of that is many ounces. Mm. And what is an ounce of gold worth right now? Uh. Finance show right here. Gold. An ounce of gold, two grand. Spot price. A kilo of gold, 62,000. So JP Morgan is basically saying, I suppose, that it's actually a couple kilos. Mm. They think one Bitcoin could be equivalent to a couple kilos of gold from a scarcity supply and demand perspective. There yeah. will be no more Bitcoins, right? It's inherently limited. Yeah. Gold, I guess we we don't really know exactly how much remains. Yeah, or we have how, to dig up the earth. Exactly, or how out. expensive it would continue to be to, to, to produce gold. But anyway... I'm not trying to start a war because I know the gold people, the Bitcoin people, they go head to head, man. Yeah. Maybe both things will continue to be valuable in some form or another, but uh, but certainly Bitcoin is the hot topic right now. And gold is to a certain extent, but gold's been around. We're all well aware. Imagine on $146,000 Bitcoin though. Remember I had a few of them. I misplaced them. Oh. <laughs> oh. You love that story. That always makes you frustrated. <laughs> oh. Let's Speaking of bitcoins, this is one of the uh, one of the drawbacks. Bitcoin uh, robbers steal more than HK three million in Bitcoin from a trader and then escape after kicking him out of a car on a Hong Kong hillside. So this is this is one of those. This will be probably tougher to do in gold. Mm -hmm. Maybe not actually, because HK three million, three million Hong Kong dollars, is only about. 387,000 US. Oh, really? Yeah. So oh. that's not actually that much gold, is it? It's a few ounces of gold. A few ounces. A few ounces. That's something. Yeah, okay. All but right. Fine. It's a few. Really I guess worth, actually, though. never mind. It's a couple kilos, isn't it? Yeah. We just did this gold price yeah. thing. But anyway, uh, this is whenever you have a store of value that is untraceable or difficult to trace these this potential exists for theft obviously there's been many bitcoin stories like this in the past some of them enormous like that mount gox stuff early mm -hmm. on and all this bitcoin goes missing very dramatic so this this uh, this potential exists for this stuff to go missing or for people to be robbed and for uh, for it to be relatively untraceable. The way that this particular scam went down, these individuals who are described in the article as being non-Chinese, which to me was interesting. I was like, that doesn't help me in identifying them. I mean, it does a little bit, but can we be somewhat more specific? Uh -huh. Like any bit more specific? Anyway, they described as non-Chinese. What they did is they posed as Bitcoin buyers. Uh, hoping to purchase this amount, I guess it was 15 Bitcoin. Yeah. They were trying to purchase 15 Bitcoin and they met with this individual and transacted the cash for the Bitcoin in the amount of $387,000 US, which is HK3 million. After the deal is done, they shove this guy into a sedan, some sort of vehicle, drive him around town a little bit, 
take the cash back. Actually, another vehicle arrived and robbed him of cash, the cash and two phones. Uh. Probably so he couldn't communicate with anybody quickly. Left him on the hillside and then bounced. So they had the Bitcoin and the cash. Now, it's important to note, by the way, that cash in and of itself is kind of risky stuff mm. to, to be carrying around almost 400 grand USD. So, but I think most people kind of kind of are aware of that as opposed to the bit, well, either way, it's obviously some risky dealings. You meet up with some random dudes and wire over, send over 15 Bitcoin mm -hmm. and then have them hand you a briefcase, actually 300 grand US I don't know if it's a briefcase. Three three million HK. I don't know what those bills look like. It's probably a lot. Yeah. And uh, you got to be wondering at that moment if everything's going to go according to plan. Mm -hmm. Got to be at least a little nervous. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe this guy's got HK 100 million or something. And he doesn't care that much. And he's like, I do this every day. Yeah. But I cash so. dealings, I mean, you know this from, as you said, selling things. Cash dealings always a little bit more uh, slippery. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm just thinking like even digital is very slippery too, right? Well, when, well, well, certainly if you're talking about Bitcoin. Yeah. But there are others, digital transactions like via PayPal or your credit card There's or like something. A third party. There is some level of recourse with the more traditional banking model. Although many people will tell you horror stories of that where uh -huh. they got the thing on eBay, PayPal didn't back them up and yeah, or they never got paid, you know. There's, there's even problems there. So transactions can be difficult. Mm -hmm. And, well, for this particular individual, he had a very difficult transaction. And now the hunt is on for these non-Chinese culprits. OnePlus is teasing a fitness band with heart rate and sleep tracking. Now, I don't, I don't really know. We had a rumor uh, previously about OnePlus finally doing a smartwatch, having teased the idea, and then Pete Lau was on twitter talking about doing it well uh this I, at first i saw this i was like oh they're just gonna do a fitness band they're not gonna do a watch based on this report but it actually looks like they they might do both that they may do a low cost fitness band and then a slightly more premium watch at a later date and the fitness band might come first uh android central reporting that oneplus is going to release a fitness band before its regular smartwatch is ready Set to arrive in the first quarter 2021, priced around or just below 40 bucks. Said to have an AMOLED screen, water resistance, multi-day battery life. Some of the exciting stuff for me is around the sensors, SPO2 blood saturation monitoring, IP68 water protection, and some form of sleep tracking as well. Now, obviously, as you know, OnePlus shares a lot of its DNA with Oppo, the Oppo brand. So Oppo makes fitness trackers there could be some pretty strong inspiration coming from there however it's not it, this doesn't mean that they're not going to do a watch it actually sounds like they're still going to do a watch as well so a couple different options for hmm. people i'm not sure where they're going to launch it either uh there's there's a particular leak out of india that it's going to launch for 34 dollars in india and i know oneplus has put a ton of attention into the indian market could be a limited launch or could be global, but a $34 starting price, pretty attractive, mm -hmm. fairly affordable. Auto sales in 2020 are expected to hit the lowest point in nearly a decade. Obviously not the most encouraging time to buy an automobile. They are expensive things and the world is kind of in a bit of a unknown state for the time being. And so it's not surprising to see that these uh, 2020 numbers not looking great. This is a lot of the reason why people are so excited about Tesla is because their numbers looked good still. Mm -hmm. So even in the midst of a pandemic, they were able to move more vehicles than expected. Not the case for most of the auto industry. Analysts from several research firms expect US vehicle sales to total 14.4 million to 14.6 million in 2020 when the official numbers come through, which is down 15% from a year earlier, marking the lowest levels since all the way back in 2012. And Willie Do is finding something amusing here that we need to get to the bottom of. <laughs> 
Well, I'm just saying we got to get some subscriptions going. Oh, yeah. We're getting paywalled all over the place. Yeah. Let's buy them all. We support oh, We support all publications. We need Wall Street Journal. We need uh, definitely South China Morning Post. Yes. Bloomberg. Yeah. Let's get a month. Let's oh, get yeah. a bunch of these things. But anyway, so the point being here is the traditional automotive industry is down a little bit, but this could, you could take this the other way and say, well, now people are ready to get out the house. Mm -hmm. 2021, about to be a major comeback. Also, people, as you know, Will, they're looking for other forms of leisure, seeing as how a lot of the traditional ones have kind of uh, faded away. You're not sitting in a movie theater. You're going on fewer vacations. Maybe you upgrade the vehicle. You get a larger vehicle. You go on more road trips to the, I don't know, oh, where, yeah. you, where do you go? To There's the hikes. Hikes. Camping. Camping Camp. is big right now. National park National parks, type, yeah. type adventures. Uh, getting out into the wilderness seems okay. Although yeah. I bet you up in those northern parts, they're like, please stop coming, bringing all that, bringing that stuff to our, mm -hmm. this is where we're at. Mm-hmm. But anyway, none, uh, no, no matter what, wilderness allows for space, and which is what people are talking about and, and what mattered in 2020 and will continue to ma matter for a period in 2021. But, and so, the, so if you're, uh, we, could do the, we could take the rebound approach here and the idea that the auto automotive industry has a huge potential for a rebound effect in 2021. Yeah. Remember those early robot videos where uh, Boston Dynamics would kick and hit Spot in its early form? They would essentially abuse Spot. Uh -huh. I mean, not abuse. Obviously, it's part of their testing. But it was interesting because they had a real transition away from that into not ever showcasing anything like that because mm -hmm. they didn't want the rap to become that these are... Uh, war machines, essentially, that you can't defeat them, you can't kick yeah, them, you can't fight back. They yeah, exactly. They wanted to get away from that. But those are some of the coolest clips. When they, what was that guy's name? Was Big Dog, that particular uh -huh. robot? I think so. And the military the guy in the military outfit kicks it. It stumbles, but it stays upright. Man, these are some of the hottest Boston Dynamics clips ever. I'm having nostalgia just looking at this. Well, anyway, they stopped. Boston Dynamics stopped. They made an effort to say, like, we don't want to be sh putting the conversation in that direction around this stuff. So they kind of stopped doing it once Spot became widely available and they, they became a, a more commercially commercial-facing company. But that doesn't mean that no one else can do it. You now have this, uh, this company here. What are they called? What is the name of this company? China, a team of researchers from China's Shejiang University, where this company, Zhu Ying, where that hardware was developed, they have been <laughs> doing all the kicking. They've been doing all the kicking. Drop kicks the robot there. Yeah, all the kicking, all the pushing, all the pulling, oh. and all the unexpected. Uh, impacts and contact they've taken over where boston dynamics left off now i know having experience with the commercially available spot that spot can do all of these things uh -huh. whether you've intentionally knocked spot over or not so it's not that boston dynamics products can't do that it's that they didn't want to use it as marketing material they choose anymore. not to advertise the S potential violence <laughs> well, sure sure any or type beings. of Im impact or confrontation. Yeah. And so, anyway, this uh, this particular company here has taken over, and they, they think that they're going to be able to to have some sort of an advantage here. If you scroll down a little further, you can see somebody running up and poking this little robot. With a stick? With a stick, and then he runs away. You see that? <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know how practical this stuff is. I think the interesting part is given a variety of different landscapes, a variety of different uh, you know, uh, grass and pavement and mm -hmm. being pushed over and pulled over in different ways that the, the, the robot is dynamic enough to deal with these various, this variety of circumstances. That's kind of the point of this thing. And it's more complex than it looks, man. When you start to look at the programming stuff, 
It's tremendously complex the way that this robot has to see the world, interact with the world, adapt, and recover in the real world. Yeah. So Boston Dynamics isn't beating up its robots anymore, but you, you, sure, you sure as well know other people are going to be doing it. The Japan fish, fish auction, the famous one mm -hmm. that you, I'm sure, have heard of where there have been so many record-setting tuna sales. In fact, I think it was, it was last year or two years ago, the all-time record, but there's, there's new records set all the time. And uh, tuna is always the hot topic. And um, it's often one guy who's the, who calls himself the king or something like this, the king of tuna. And, and he comes in with, with the hefty bid for the nicest tuna, and he would use it kind of as a, yeah, the sushi king, that's his name. He would use it as a promotional mechanism for his variety of restaurants, right? So he would have a number of sushi restaurants, and this would make national press, international press, and people would say, I want to eat at the sushi king's place mm -hmm. because he's always got the, the hot tuna. Three million dollars for a giant bluefin tuna. Yeah, that, that could be your record setter right there from a previous year. Anyway, this time around, the Tuna King failed to bid, and he's citing pandemic woes. Oh. So he's not playing at the same level as he previously was. He said, nah, it's time for restraint. By the way, his, uh, his real name, Kiyoshi Kimura, he said he wanted to show restraint at the New Year's auction after the pandemic because it had caused so much suffering, particularly in the restaurant business, right? Restaurant business suffering. Tokyo, we talked about this yesterday. Maybe that was off the air, how their COVID problems are accelerating mm -hmm. right now. And it's just a weird time to be, I suppose, uh, outfitting your sushi shops with record-setting tuna. However, there, was still, there were still some really expensive tuna sales that took place. You had a 459-pound, 208-kilo bluefin, and that was the most expensive fish of the day. It was purchased for $202,000, so not nothing, I'll tell you what, but certainly far off from the multi-million dollar tuna that we've seen in the past, mm -hmm. upwards of 600-pound uh, type tunas, things like this. But you got to feel for the tuna king. I always look forward to that report every year to see what the highest selling fish was that year. Uh -huh. I've been paying attention the last couple of years, and this year it's a bit lukewarm, like a lot of things this year. But uh -huh. here's to next year. Going to have another record setting tuna. Starbucks is launching some new products, and it had an, there's an interesting tidbit in this particular article around cold versus hot coffee beverages hmm. now you willie do are uh are you a young man or an old man i don't know actually can you clarify that for me i think i'm old i'm a pretty you're an old, old man guy. okay so yeah. you that would make you over the age of 30 yes it does okay so willie do over the age of 30 he is not a part of gen z i guess no however starbucks likes gen z a lot yeah. Starbucks very interested in figuring out how to capture and and keep that generation <laughs> of individuals. And the way that they're doing that is with more cold coffee. Because the Gen Z, they love the cold coffee, Will. And we have some statistics here to prove it. Are you ready? Gen Z coffee drinkers under 30 are two times more likely to drink cold coffee which has led to more than one billion in sales in the past three years. Hmm. Let me just clarify that real quick for you, Will, in case you missed it. Drinkers under 32 times more likely to go cold as opposed to hot, including in the cold months. They stated a cold drinks as uh -huh. well. Now, let me ask you, where do you land on this? Are you old man hot coffee drinker or are you young man cold coffee drinker? You know, I picked up coffee like recently. I'm more of a tea guy. And I used to drink exclusively cold uh, coffee, like iced coffee. Um, not the Frappuccinos, but just iced coffee, regular. But that changed uh, recently uh, to hot coffee.
like just in general, I enjoy hot coffee a lot more. Hot so coffee. Getting, yeah, I'm just old. You're old fashioned. Very. Just straight very up much so. hot coffee. Yeah, I'm yeah. with you. I do both. I'm more of a cold coffee summer guy, hot coffee winter guy. Yeah. But either way, we're both ancient. We're definitely not Gen Z. Cold beverage program at Starbucks has grown nearly 45% in the past four years. Yeah. The chain is going to bring out a brand new cold drink. It's the, and you, I don't know, you might like this. It's the honey almond milk cold brew. You won't like it because you don't drink almond milk. You have yeah, to. I, you know, I might get hurt. You have to just substitute the almond milk portion. To oat milk. Oat which milk. Is great. Or milk. Or, yeah, just it's up to milk. you, but actually, that's another area that they're that they're growing in Starbucks. The milks, the mm -hmm. variety of milks. There's 17 milks you can get now. Yeah, you got oat milk, you got almond milk, you got coconut. soy milk, obviously. Coconut milk. Maybe you got coconut milk. Yeah. You got milk milk. I'm sure I'm missing some milks right now. Someone's screaming about like you can probably get cashew milk. Yeah. Hold I on. would bet I'm there's, ca I don't know if Starbucks carries it, but there's a lot of milks. It's all about the milk these days. Non-fat, 2%, soy, coconut, almond. That's the Starbucks offerings. And the oat milk is the hot one right now. Anyway, honey almond milk cold brew made with slow steeped cold brew coffee and topped with almond milk available for a limited time in order to satisfy those Gen Z types. So Starbucks is uh, not slowing down. They're speeding up. They got plenty of new products planned, new food products as well. And they recently announced plans to upgrade the pay for all of their U.S. employees to a minimum wage of $15 over the next three years for the whole, all the U.S. staff. Oh. So Starbucks they're doing well. sounds are, sound like they're doing all right, whether you buy a hot coffee or a cold coffee. Mm. They'll count your money either way. Yeah. That coffee stuff. Pizza Hut is offering a free, nothing but stuffed crust. <laughs> this promo, this headline and this promo really is really confusing to me. Well, I'm quite confused. I don't know if you can tell. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm flustered. I'm yeah. flabbergasted. Yeah. The pizza chain is giving away free stuffed crust for $10 pizza purchases. Now, you're wondering, what do you mean stuffed crust? Isn't that just, what would that even be? Isn't that, are those like cheese sticks? Is that like some crust with cheese in the middle, but they're in the form of sticks that you can eat? No, Will, that's not what it is. If you scroll down, you'll see what it is. It's okay. an actual stuffed crust missing the pizza. Oh, just go a little further, Will. Don't you worry. It's going to oh, be there. That looks delicious. Watch mm -hmm. this. That's what you get on the right. Oh, good. It's a <laughs> dough ring. <laughs> a ring of dough filled with cheese, nothing but stuffed crust. Now, you do still have delicious, to... delicious, by the way. <laughs> you still have to buy a pizza to get that. That is oh. really weird. That's what would show up at your house. You would have the pizza on the left, and the second box would just be the crust. Huh. Now... I don't know who wants this, but obviously it captured my attention enough to talk about it. And that seems to be the thing with promos in this era, in 2020, 2021. If you can get people to talk about it, it did its mm. job. Yes. And sometimes you have to be a bit absurd in order to achieve that. And that's, they're celebrating, by the way, the anniversary of Stuffed Crust. There have been many imitators, but Pizza Hut, the originator, as far as I know, 25th anniversary, original Stuffed Crust Pizza. Now, this is not going to be available at very many locations. In fact, to start, it's only going to be two locations, one in Dallas, one in Los Angeles. So very few people are going to have a chance to just get the stuffed crust. However, I, I think people are going to pick it up just to get that Instagram photo. They're going to be, check out my stuffed crust only. Yeah. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, Will. McDonald's is finally here to do battle with the real chicken sandwich. I don't know if you knew this, Will, but the chicken sandwiches that they currently offer are not really there to compete with the stuff that's going on at the Popeyes and the Chick-fil-A's. Yeah. And I don't even know if you remember the great chicken sandwich wars of 2020? The great chicken off? 
Or was it even 2019? I don't even 2019, remember. 2019, I think. 2019. Was a big time for chicken. The Great sandwiches. Chicken Wars, which will never be forgotten for generations well, to come. you forgot. <laughs> Anyway, it was the Popeye's chicken sandwich. No one can get it. We're going to line up. We're going to fight one another. We got to get the chicken sandwich. Obviously, that's cooled off a little bit, but you know, McDonald's, they got to get it right. They got so many locations and and it's just quite an operation over there. I guess they've been workshopping what their chicken sandwich should be to truly compete with this one. And now they're ready to go. They're ready to go and they want your money, Willie Do. And let me explain okay, to you real well, quick. They got it. What they're going to bring to the table for this particular war, for this particular battle. It's going to come in three forms, this chicken sandwich. You're going to get a, there's a spicy version. I think there's a deluxe version and a crispy version. The crispy is going to feature pickles and a toasted potato roll. That's it. I don't know what a potato roll is, by the way. You put potato in the, in the, in the bread? I think so. There is potato elements, just like the Popeye's uh, potato roll. Popeye's roll is they, potato yeah. as well? Yeah. So what does that give you? It gives you a little, like, almost like a French fry flavor in there? Yeah. I've eaten it, You know by what? The way. I'm not a bread aficionado. I, I can't really taste I didn't notice it. It, it is either. good, though. I didn't notice it either. Yeah. To me, it's a fresh bun. Yeah. But anyway, so the, you get the crispy model. It's going to have pickles and a toasted potato roll. The spicy version is going to feature spicy pepper sauce and a toasted potato roll. And then there's a deluxe version, which is going to feature lettuce, tomatoes, and mayo. So that's the most uh, elaborate one in terms of toppings. Uh -huh. Which one would you go for out of those three? Is it the regular crispy? Is it the spicy? Or is it the deluxe? I'll get the deluxe. He's going all the way, ladies and gentlemen. Of course. Going for the deluxe, so... Anyway, Willie Doo's going to start lining up. He's got his money ready to go. And uh, McDonald's, is they don't mind taking it as well. So he's about to get himself a hot coffee and a mm. deluxe chicken sandwich. Look at Willie Doo. Nobody's doing better than him right now. All right, last story of the day. This one caught my attention because I was recently watching those Mandalorian stuff. All that Mandalorian uh -huh. stuff. And uh, this is, I, I suppose, this publication, The Guardian, every so often they attempt to tackle something from film a problem right. that took place in film and they try to solve it or, I don't know, generate some level of insight into why something is the way it is. Yeah. The topic of this article, why can't the stormtroopers shoot straight in Star Wars? Why can't they shoot straight? Do you have any, does this, do you have any insight here before we get into the, no, th their uh, reasoning? No, I don't. But this is a long-standing joke. Yeah. For a lot of uh, yeah. people, yeah. Um, yeah, they are clones. Spoiler alert! <laughs> hey, man, they all—they're all you know the same, and uh, yeah, maybe they just have something with pressure. <laughs> they, they're just—they can't aim straight <laughs> under pressure. I don't know why the Empire keeps bothering with them. They never do anything. Well, they're cannon fodder mostly. I know, you but know? they don't even—they barely even slow anything down. Uh, yeah. Jedi's just run them over. Yeah, I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, I've been, but I've been watching that Mandalorian, and uh, it's obvious they exist as props for these action sequences. Yeah, like they get run down. Exactly, they're there, as you said, cannon fodder, which is fine. I think you need that in a movie or a, a, t a series or mm -hmm. whatever. You got to have certain enemies it's like when you're playing a video game. Some of the enemies have to be easy, and then that escalates, and they get harder, and it's a kind of a balance to it, but you would think that these are trained soldiers by this tremendously powerful enterprise, the uh -huh. Empire, uh -huh. and that's really their only task. They don't have another job. And they're very well equipped. They have armor and they have their blaster. These cannon. should be elite forces. Yeah. They're not that elite. And they keep missing. So anyway, they try to solve it here. I don't know that they get any closer than we just did. They're First speculation is uh, something to do with the helmet. It's hard to see in the helmet. Oh, yeah. And there have been references to that. There was actually a moment in Mandalorian where one of them is disguised. That's not a spoiler. One of them has to put on an Empire helmet, and they're like, it's impossible to see in here. Yeah. So they make jokes about that. They kind of make a joke about the fact that the Stormtrooper outfit is not great. Or that stormtroopers are dumb. You've, I mean, you wore one. Oh wow! 
Wow, what a throwback. Holy moly. Willie Do just brought up a really old video, Becoming the Sound Trooper, where I uh, pasted, I Velcroed a bunch of Bluetooth speakers to hockey shoulder pads, put on a Stormtrooper helmet. I know this sounds impossible. Like, did this actually happen? And then I, I walked through the city and got some yep. reactions as That's I blared, right I blared, uh, what was the song? I the, mean, the Darth Vader song. Yeah, well, there's a name for it, but anyway, yeah. The song, When Darth Vader Arrives, and the people were very, uh, they didn't know what to make of it. Look at this. Wow. Young, young Street. Young yeah. Lou taking risks out there in public. Are you? Yeah, no, it's so difficult. It's fogging up in the helmet, <laughs> and it's it, it's so hot. it's a relatively hot day as well. Look at middle of Young Dundas. Look how active Young Dundas is yeah. at the moment. This guy didn't like it too much. He saw the camera. He's like, no, no, thank you. That guy didn't mind it. He's like, hey, man, thumbs up. It's a little a little quick sideways thumbs up. But uh, you know, I got the five guys in the video as well. It all worked surprisingly. Daisy chain all those speakers together. Uh huh. Look at the size of fries over there, five guys. Don't make we're gonna get hungry now. Well, we can't okay, be doing okay. this. We can't be doing this. But so that's one. What were some of the other uh, speculations here? Oh, perhaps it's the presence of the force. Just a small amount of force presence that just sort of tweaks the delivery of these things a little bit. Oh, okay. Look, man, I don't how do people go in depth on this stuff? It's obvious. That from a storytelling perspective, you need enemies leading up to the main enemies that are easy to kill in these battles. You need to create yeah. these battle scenes, and you got to have stormtroopers. And why can't it just be like that? Why does it have to like become so analytical? <laughs> because it's Star the fiction, Wars. The fiction has to be like truth, analytical. I think particularly science. in science fiction. Because it has that science component so, yeah. and it attracts the scientific types. And so, therefore, they want to go into it and be like, uh, you know, what is it about a Stormtrooper E-11 rifle that causes it to go off kilter? And and then and the next thing you know, it's an entire report uh -huh. on what's going on. And, uh, and the truth of the matter is to create a fun action movie, the heroes have to have access to certain enemies that let them build up numbers. Yeah. Cause as they do, the 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 story becomes more amazing, more entertaining. Yeah. I mean, it's weird to even have to say it, but that's sort of like when people were talking about that Lord of Lord of the Rings stuff, mm -hmm. the huge battles. Yeah. It's the scale the of scale. it. Scale. Yeah. And how you can't really achieve the scale of it and still tell the story without having certain enemies that are easier to defeat. Yeah, I mean, just thinking about one Jedi versus, you know, a thousand Stormtroopers, that's a good story. It's fun. Yeah. 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 You know? So. All right. I got all fired up about this. Stormtroopers can't shoot straight because it's a movie, and they, they have to make a movie. <laughs> yeah. So they're trying to make a movie. Yeah. And a show. It's problem solved. And they're trying to entertain you, and they're trying to manage a lot of different criteria. And they're trying to do a lot here. And yeah, by yeah. and and by the way, this is not I'm not it's not a negative take for me on the thing. I enjoyed the Mandalorian stuff. I told you that already. 